Okay, uh, welcome to this lecture in web servers. Uh, this is the topics of today. We will talk a little bit about uh, HTTP, the history, how, how it works, and then we'll go on to web servers, what that is, how they work, and the different kinds. Uh, as usual, I want to have some channel to communicate with the students who are not here in the classroom. Uh, and to do that, we use the system Pingu. Please go to that URL that you have at the bottom uh, or use the QR code. Uh, you can use it on your mobile phone or just another tab in your browser. So I have a question that I wanted to start with. And this is it. You will, you will have one, one minute. So if you go to that URL, uh, you will get this question. And so, some of the viewers will still get this uh, 505 un unauthorized. So show the URL again. OK, sorry. Uh, so that's much better. Good. Let's see if I can get the link. And we shall see the results. Yes. Here we go. Uh, and that looks quite, quite OK, I think. Uh, the only thing that you might also have checked is the UDP, uh, but we will get to that uh, during the lecture. Uh, so what is happening when we're trying to visit a web page? Uh, let's say we have a, a client computer, or trying to go to google.com. So it opens its uh, browser and type in the address. Well, after that, a lot of things happen. Uh, his computer is connected to some sort of network. Uh, it could be a company network, it could be a private network at home, but he's connected in some way. It doesn't have to be a physical, it can be a wireless connection, of course. Uh, and when he got his IP address, if he got in through DHCP or manually entered, he also entered uh, or gotten an IP address for the DNS server because you have to look up the address, the IP address for the domain in order to know which server uh, will host this uh, site. So he will, let's say it's a company. So it's connected to the company network and somewhere in the company, we have a DNS server who's also connected to the, the network. So he will make, or the browser will ask uh, the resolver that we talked about during the DNS. I want to get the IP for this uh, name. So it will send that to the DNS server. The DNS server will look in its database. Do I know this address? Probably he doesn't, uh, because it's not, you're not, we're not working at Google. <laughs> so that DNS server, or the company, is connected to the internet uh, in some way, uh, probably uh, with a router or something like that. Uh, and the DNS server will contact either one of the root name servers or another uh, name server that it will forward questions it can't answer to. So he will redirect the question out into the world and get an answer back. And then he will provide that back to the browser or the resolver. OK, so now we have an IP address. I don't know which one. Uh, actually, it's a Google address, so I just type something here. Uh, and then the browser will make a connection. Let's say here on the internet, somewhere we have that server. So the computer will go through the local network and go out to the internet and contact that server and start to communicate and get that page. 
we can, let's see if this works. So how will this look? Uh, well, if we are trying to be a browser here now in the terminal, uh, we'll try to get the address for uh, www.google.com. And we use the nslookup command for that. And we will get an answer. And the answer is coming from alba.lnu.se. This is the name server that my computer here is connected to. So it will answer, ask that for a recursive uh, answer. So it will, will want the full answer. And our server then will make a lot of ans uh, questions to root servers and other servers to get this address. That's why it states a non-authoritative answer, because the name server that I've got the answer for is not uh, authoritative for this zone. If you want, if you want an, uh, an actual question uh, answer from the real server, how do you do that? If I wanted an authoritative answer for this question. So now, I do remember what I talked about during previous lecture. Well, then I have to contact one of the name servers for Google. If we go into the, the lookup and lookup command, we could ask just for the name servers. And now I answer, uh, ask the same question, uh, www google.com. It will then provide me with the uh, start of authority record for the google.com domain. And here we see uh, it provides with the primer, primary name server is ns1.google.com. So if you want to, we can change servers to ns1.google.com. And we have to change back the, the type of question to an A record. So set type. Oh. And then ask for vv.google.com. And now you see that the server that is giving me the answer is this server, and I don't get that option non-authoritative answer. So he is authorized to give the really correct answer for the www.google.com uh, record. OK. So we can actually try to contact this web server through the terminal and see what we get if we have telnet or something like that installed, which we don't. Maybe we have party. Yes. OK, this is just a, a terminal uh, application to, to uh, connect via SSH or telnet or raw connection, which we will do now, to this server. And we will use the port 80, and that's because uh, web servers have a default port of 80, so that's the port that we want to, to knock on to get into the web server. And we get a blank page here. We are connected, we didn't get an error. So how do you communicate with the web server? Well, you can type a get command, and then we need some resource on that server humans.txt maybe Google have. You know what that uh, uh, page is because you've used that in a previous course. And then we get an answer back. It also closed the connection. Uh, but the answer is quite readable. Uh, the first part, we don't have to <coughs> worry about just now, 
it's the header. You get some header information back from the server. But then you get the, the file, the content of the, that file that you requested. So if I would go to www.google.com uh, slash humans.txt in a browser, we will get this text. Human text. And that's the text. We don't get the header here. We can see that if we turn on developer tools and stuff like that. OK. Mm -hmm. So another question then. The same URL. Don't use the QR code because I think that's updated. Uh, we'll get one minute for this. In what language does a web server communicate? OK, let's see the result. And most of you picked the uh, hypertext transfer protocol, which is the correct one. And we will talk about what that is now. The internet protocol are used, but in, well, we'll, we'll come to that. So it all started here. Do you know where here is? CERN. Yes. This is CERN. Uh, with European Organization for Nuclear Research, uh, which is a, a research facility for that a lot of uh, company, I don't know companies, but a lot of uh, different uh, uh, countries are uh, a part of, and uh, mostly European. There are some non-European countries who are in this organization. And it started in the mid 50s I think and why is that important well a man named Tim Berners-Lee worked there as an independent consultant uh, as a developer I think um, and there were a lot of different researchers deep research teams and a lot of documents and one of the prog that project that was going on there was a project called hypertext uh, which was a way to link documents together with hyperlinks. And in the late 80s, uh, CERN was one of the biggest node in Europe uh, in the uh, internet. Uh, and Berners-Lee thought that why not connect these two, the hypertext documents with the internet. So this is a quote he gave to some uh, report, I think, uh, a couple of years back. Uh, and he and some colleague of his uh, created the first draft, I think, if we look at this picture. This is the first uh, web server. Uh, back then, this was the only web server, hence the note, don't shut up this machine. The internet, uh, the web will go down. Uh, and you see over here also a, a paper that he wrote, uh, information management proposal on how the web will, would look like. And at this time it was meant just for the researchers to have a way to uh, link documents together and share this information with other researchers. Jacob, you, you must mention the, uh, the note in the top. <coughs> It's from his boss, he wrote. Oh, yes. Uh, vague, but interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to see here. There's a little note up here. He, he submitted this paper to his boss, and then he, the answer he got that, well, th that sounds good, but nah, maybe it's a bit vague. Uh, so when we talk about the in internet and the web, we usually have a simplified model. Uh, you have been taught about the OSI model, which has seven layers. Thomas Ivason was talking about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and here we have the Internet Protocol Suite, or the TCP IP stack, 
which is a simplified model. At the uh, very bottom, we have the link layer or the network layer, where we have the, the cables and the hardware. And then we have the internet layer, which uh, is the, where the IP protocols live. And then you have a transmission uh, layer, where TCP and UDP. You should know what these are by now. And on the, on the, on the top, we have the application layer, where we have uh, HTTP, DNS, and SM. TP and other protocols that we use. So the web sites back then weren't maybe not so uh, advanced. It was just documents with links in them. That was the main purpose. Uh, the today's web application are quite different. Uh, but this is the essential, that we have a server called a web server and a client, usually a browser. Uh, and they have this traditional model of a client and server. The client makes a request and then the server will respond uh, with something. And the language that they are talking with the protocol is HTTP. Uh, we usually say that uh, the HTTP is a stateless protocol. And what, what we mean by that is when the client has requested a, a page and then it got it back, the server will forget about the connection. It doesn't have some sort of session that uh, he knows when the client make another request uh, what the client used, uh, did before. It doesn't know that. And back in the in the beginning, they didn't have any thought about security because it was meant to be used just by scientists and uh, researchers. And then they think that anyone would use this uh, protocol in a bad manner. So it has no built-in security. All the messages are sent in clear text. So if you're a, a router or something in between here, then you can read just like you saw, the, the, the text that you got back. Uh, here are the different versions of the HTTP. In, back in 1991, it was only used in CERN. So the first real version was five years later, 1996, that's been used. And after that, they made some updates to version 1.1. And that's what we've been using up until now. So in, uh, in our thinking with the web that things changes fast, uh, we have a really old protocol that we are using. Um, but there have made, been made some changes and uh, the HTTP version 2 is since just one year ago uh, and standard. But we'll, we'll come to that, why we needed to update the protocol. Uh, when we communicate over uh, HTTP, we use methods or verbs uh, when the client sends a request to the server. Uh, it has these, they are, I think they can be some more verbs actually, but this is the, the main, the big ones. Uh, the first one is a get that I used in the command, as you saw. And then when you wanted to get some data from the server. It can be a, a page or a, a search result or something like that. Uh, usually we say that the get command shouldn't, if I request the same page, I should get the same uh, answer back. But that has uh, changed uh, a bit, uh, so that's not a, a standard, you can say that. You can use the post uh, verb, and that's usually done, uh, will use when we want to create something on the web server. Maybe we are trying to create a user or something like that. Then uh, the client can send a post with the information about that new user, and the server will create that or store that in some database or something like that. We have the put, where we want to update the data. So maybe we have a user and he wants to change his address or something like that. Uh, here we usually 
puts the complete information about the user. So maybe we first get the page with the user information. You change something, and then you will put that entire user object, or what you say, uh, back to the server. Uh, then we have patch, which is for partially updating resource. These are not used that much uh, right now, I think. Uh, you can use them when you're a developer, if you want to. Uh, then we have the delete verb, which is for deleting a, a resource. Uh, if you just wanted to get the header, we can use the head. And then we can use the options to check what the server supports. Uh, the server then will uh, make a reply, and you, uh, you will get the information back. And then in the header, you will also get status codes on uh, the information. So we have these. Uh, there are a lot of, I don't know how many status codes there are, but there are a couple of hundred. And they have grouped this into different categories. Uh, the 100 is for information. Uh, the 200s are for successful. So the, the usual, if you, I request the page, I will get the page, and in the header I will get a status code of 200. Uh, if I use the, the post uh, verb, I will probably get the 201 back, making that it's OK. And these are so we can have some sort of, of standard. Uh, but you can use them in any way you want, actually if you can control both the client and the, the server part. Uh, the 300s are for redirections. Maybe you have created a user and then want to redirect the, the user to that newly created user page or something. Then the server can respond with, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the new URL. So the client will make a new request. And then we have the 400s, which are about client errors. You, uh, the most common is 404, which is when the resource doesn't exist. So if you try to get a page or a, a document on a server which doesn't uh, exist, the server will respond with 404. And then we have the 500 is uh, used when the server, something bad happened at that server. OK, so HTTP is quite old, but it works. Here we see a, a session of uh, when we are getting uh, data from a regular Swedish newspaper. Uh, and as you can see, this is just the, the start page of that. Uh, I think it's, we don't have to name anybody. Uh, but as you see here, this is just for the, their start page. And to get that start page, it had to load make 760 requests for just one page. You can also see the, how, how much the site, that, that page weighs. So it transferred 5.2 megabyte, which doesn't seem that much uh, with today's internet connections. So why would this be a problem? You can see that it took almost uh, 50, uh, 45 seconds. And that's quite long. Well, probably you will get some, the most, uh, uh, you, the main of the page you will see actually before that. This is the entire, all the ads and all the uh, other things, uh, the images and stuff like that. But the information will probably be visible for you um, much uh, sooner than. 45 seconds. So why all these requests? Well, that's how uh, HTTP 1.1 uh, works. When you started to have, you, you want to make a request for, for, uh, for a page. The client will start with a TCP handshake. It has to, to do that uh, because it uses the TCP, TCP protocol. And it is 
the, the client sends a sin and the server will respond with the sin ack and the client will respond with an ack. Now we can start to communicate with HTTP and make a request. And as you see, it makes a request for just one resource and then the server will respond. It can make requests for multiple, but then it will get them back in that order. It can't transfer them all at once. It has to make this. And when it's done, it will close uh, the connection. And the browser and the, the protocol has some limitations on how many of these you can have simultaneously. So even if we would have a really fast internet connection, it wouldn't help. Because of this handshake part and how many concurrent connections we can have from the browser, it doesn't matter because the, the, the amount of data isn't that much, but you have a lot of latency uh, because of these handshakes and the requests. So this is a graph. So if uh, you can see up until one or two megabits per second, then you will benefit from a faster connection. But after that, not so much. So uh, actually, it, it was Google that first started to realize that this was a problem. Maybe they not, wasn't the first one, but they was the first one to try to do something about it. And they uh, developed something called Speedy. Then they realized probably that we shouldn't do this alone. We should uh, have help from others, so this can be a standard uh, that a lot of web servers and clients use. And then they contacted the Internet uh, Engineering Task Force, which is an organization that handles internet standards. So last year, they made this proposal of standard, uh, the RFC 7540, which you can read about if you click that link. That is the specification of the uh, HTTP2. Uh, so what's the news in the HTTP2? Well, the big one is something called multiplexing, where they can use a single TCP connection and make a lot of requests. And that will speed up things quite a bit. And uh, they also have something called server push, uh, a technique to push out messages to the clients. Uh, with the HTTP uh, version 1 uh, and before the 2.0, the server can't, because it's stateless, it doesn't know the clients. So it can't send out information to the clients. Uh, but we have used something in before that called WebSockets that doesn't use the, they, that will make that the client has a connection to the server always and keep it alive. So the server can send out information. But with this push, uh, we, I don't know if we will, that will uh, replace WebSockets. Uh, no, it's not it's, uh, the same, actually. Um, Different techniques. Uh, WebSockets will do it things to have uh, push techniques as we make in us web developers. Uh, the server push in HTTP 2 is more if you, uh, if the server um, gets our HTTP request and, and see, okay, I'm gonna send out the index.html, uh, it can um, in advance make a decision, oh, you're gonna need the, okay. the style.css and so on, and can send a promise to the client that, okay, don't ask me for these files and you will get them in some time. Okay. And that's the server push in the okay. HTTP Good. 2. So it's not compared to no. a WebSocket. Good. Thank you, John. Uh, then we have some compression of the HTTP header also. Uh, there are a YouTube video of a guy, I don't know if I've been a part of HTTP2? Yeah, I think he's one of the main. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to know more about the, the, the news in, in HTTP2, watch that video. So, web servers then. Uh, well, a web server is essential 
a server or an application, a server application that understands this protocol. I haven't mentioned before the HTTPS. Uh, well, the, the most sites that you are visiting today will use the HTTPS protocol. And how does, does that differ from HTTP? Well, only one thing. They added a layer for security. So the, the protocol itself hasn't changed. It is the same. They have just this secure socket layer, SSL, that they use to encrypt the traffic from the server to the client. But I will talk more about certificates and, and security in the last uh, lecture about security. So I won't take that uh, up now. Uh, in the beginning, uh, and also now, the main purpose was to serve static resources. And that's what they're doing also today, of course, with, for some uh, document types. So it has some way of reading files from the file system and deliver them to the client. It can be uh, pictures or documents or JavaScript files and CSS. Uh, but the other part is about uh, dynamic web resources. And here we have some sort of application, uh, server script application running who, that can dynamically create pages on the fly. So here we have some languages. You've probably heard of PHP or uh, Python or uh, yeah, uh, C Sharp that can be run on the server and create pages uh, on the fly. Uh, it can also render different web data on the fly, like HTML or JSON, which I've been working with before. It can handle communication with the database. Usually, that part is done uh, with the, the server-side script. Um, it can also make requests from other web servers. But this is the, the basic. There are a lot, the list can go on for uh, different features of web servers, but this is the main uh, part. So when talking about web servers, we have to talk some about terminology. Uh, I will go on uh, further down with some of these, but you have maybe heard of load balancer web server can act as a load balancer when it's just <coughs> one point in that it can uh, then distribute the load to m multiple servers. Because if you have a very popular uh, site, you can't handle it with just one server. Uh, you have to have multiple. And I talked about SSL, the secure socket layer. Uh, it's just an, an add-on to the HTTP protocol to make it more secure. Uh, you may have heard the term LAMP which uh, is just a term for Linux, uh, Apache, uh, MySQL, and PHP, a full stack uh, so you can develop for a, a, a um, PHP. Uh, application server you may also have heard of in uh, the same terms of, of web servers. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but some... Uh, terms may be good to learn a bit more about. So, how many of you have heard of proxies? Uh, a traditional proxy is when uh, you have to go through some server to get out to another part of the, the world. Uh, the, the proxy service usually worked in the, the beginning for companies when you didn't have an uh, and cheap internet connection, it was quite costly to have internet. So you wanted a way for all, all of our clients to go to one point and then we can cache a lot of stuff from the internet so they can get that cache. Then you had to set up in your browser that you should go through this web, uh, this cache, so this proxy server. So when we talk about reverse proxy, we talk about when clients from the internet want to find uh, one of our web servers. We can have a proxy in the foreground who then delivers the traffic to the correct web server. And why do we want to use this? Well, it can be for different reasons. 
to hide the Rydian server so they then cannot use uh, maybe bugs or stuff like that in the original server because they don't know what that server is. And you have to go through this proxy to get to the real server. Uh, it can be used for firewalls, can have a reverse proxy. So all traffic has to go through that and they can anal analyze the traffic and look for uh, different attacks uh, and eliminate them. It can also be used for distributing load for incoming requests to multiple servers. So even if we just have one server here with one IP address, it can be 10 different servers who are uh, there to even out the load for the web page. Uh, CGI is maybe something you've heard of also when talking about web servers. It's a standardized way for server to interface with some sort of executable program on the server. This is usually uh, if we have uh, a server-side scripting uh, language which we want to use, then that could have an, an uh, CGI module for that web server so we can talk to PHP or Python or something like that. Uh, you will also hear about the, the fast CGI, which is just a, a newer version that is more uh, less overhead, so it's faster. You can read about these techniques more in detail if you just Google them. Uh, you will work with something called virtual hosting. As you saw before, we <coughs> uh, when we had the client, he got the Uh, he was connected to some sort of a network, which has a DCP server, uh, and that it got back an IP address for that domain. So it looked up google.com and got back an IP address and then contacted that IP address. Well, how will the web server, he got contacted from this machine, how will he know if he has multiple websites running on the same server? Which one are you asking for? Each site has to have something that is unique. So there are different techniques for this. We have the name based, with, which is in the request. You will also have a header. And there you will specify, or the client will specify uh, the name that you were typed in, google.com or www.google.com. Uh, so it can look at that header and see, okay, you wanted www.google.com. Okay, then it's this web page, that, uh, this part of the server that you are contacting. Uh, so then it can host many of different, just as this has uh, a different name or DNS name. Uh, then it can be IP based, so this server could have multiple IP uh, network cards uh, connected or just multiple IP addresses. And then it can identify the specific website via that. Or it can be port-based. Port-based is not a good way if you want a, a publicly accessed. And, and IP address isn't that uh, good either because then the client has to, the, the user has to know that IP address and that's quite hard. And with the port-based then, <coughs> let's say, google.com, for example, then you have to specify in the client which port that you wanted uh, this to be run on. So you have to specify that on the server, and then the client also has to know that specific port, which is not so easy for them to use. So I talked about the port 80 before, and that is the default port for web servers. So if we don't specify a port, then it will use port 80. Not always. This is the, the correct URL. Uh, then it will use port 80. But if you use HTTPS, it will use uh, the port 443 instead. So those ports are quite good to know.
Should we take a 10 minute break perhaps? Yes, we do that. 10 minute break. Okay, we will start off with another question. Uh, the last one for this lecture. Have you installed a web server? And if uh, you have, which one? So you have one minute from now. So most of you had installed a web server, which is good. Uh, you will, during this course, install uh, at least two of these. Uh, only one who hasn't, so that's good. So, web servers then. There are quite a lot of different web servers. Uh, I have only collected here some, uh, the most popular. Uh, the Apache, which is the A in the LAMP stack. Uh, we have IAS, IAS and NINX. I will talk about this uh, a bit more. Uh, then we have web servers like uh, Apache Tomcat. Some people will kick me when I say it's a, a web server. Uh, some say it's an application server, but it has an. Uh, it will talk HTTP, so I will say that it's an, an uh, web server. It is used mostly if you are running Java uh, and uh, and servlets. So that's if you are a, a Java developer. Then we have the Node.js uh, that you might have heard of. That is not an a web server, but you can, in that platform, create web servers that will talk uh, with HTTP. So we can say that, that Node.js is a web server, uh, actually. Uh, a little bit about Apache. Uh, I think, let's see, that is the most common, yes. It has uh, around 50% of the market share. Uh, there are uh, a lot of different companies are collecting s statistics around uh, web servers and how they are used, but uh, most of them will, will state that Apache is the most common web server uh, out there. It's an open source HTTP server, usually called uh, HTTPD, when the D stands for daemon. Uh, uh, it's been around quite a while, since 1995. Uh, so it was one of the first one. It uses a, a request model and it spawns up a new thread uh, for every request and when that's done it will close that thread. I've read that they have made some uh, updates to Apache so that it can uh, use a different model. And there are some uh, uh, bottlenecks with using this approach uh, on how many requests you can handle each second. So. Uh, they also have a module-based system, so you, it's easy to write modules for the Apache server. Uh, there are a lot of modules included when you install it, but you have to enable each of these if you want them to run. So if you want to run PHP, it has an own module for that. It has a module for security and yeah, a lot of different uh, things. And some of, uh, for the general structure, <coughs> there probably are some third party uh, web GUI to make uh, administration for the uh, Apache server. But for most of you, you will do that in, in config files. So you will edit files when you want to create a new uh, virtual uh, server uh, and configure that. And they have these four different uh, directory, the htdoc, where you, the actual sites are, the files for the, the website. Then we have the config, where you store configuration. The logs, well, that's where the log will be kept for the, the server. And we have the uh, CGI bin, where binaries for the CGI modules will be uh, located. Uh, a little bit about, about NGINX. Uh, it's also a free web server uh, created uh, in the beginning of the 2000. Uh, it is a really fast web server for delivering static content. It can have a lot of, of uh, connection. 
It uses another approach, it uses an event-driven approach to handling requests. Uh, you will talk more about uh, this during John's course when we talk about uh, uh, Node.js, who also, which also uses an event-driven approach. Uh, and it's been quite popular the last years. Again, if we look, I think it's the second one. Uh, it's been getting a lot of ground this last couple of years. Uh, if you want, you can read up about more about the event loop uh, here. A little bit about IIS, which is uh, Microsoft's web server. You can't say that it's free because you have to have a license uh, to, for the operating system, but it's included in the Windows Server operating system. So if you have Windows Server license, then you can use uh, this. And uh, in IIS is a uh, web server included. There are actually a lot of different services. It stands for Internet Information Services. So they have an uh, SNMP server for mail and they have an F uh, FTP server that's included also. It also can ha handle a lot of different uh, server-side languages uh, with extensions and modules. You can use CDI, but they also have something called ISAPI filters that you can load in uh, to be able to uh, talk to programs on the server. Uh, they have a graphical administration, if you want to uh, use that, or you can uh, administer it uh, with PowerShell. The main reasons to use this web server if, if you have a .NET application which you want to run. I think they have opened up that platform also, so maybe not now, but in some time you will be able to run .NET applications on the other web servers also probably. So how do we choose between these different web servers? This is my opinion. <laughs> so if we search the web or talk to people, they might have a different opinion. Uh, but the Internet Information Service by Microsoft, well, that's if you wanted to run uh, C Sharp or a .NET application. Uh, then you will choose that one. Apache, well, PHP, Perl, Python, they're really good and fast for those languages if you want to do that. Uh, ending X uh, is really good at being a, a reverse proxy and delivers static content and a as a load balancer because it can handle a lot of requests per second. And you can combine these, of course. You can have, if you have a PHP uh, application, you, you will probably run that on Apache. Uh, and you may have 10 servers running that application. But in the foreground, you have an Nginx that uh, is used as a reverse proxy to deliver load between these different servers. I think you do that in John's course. You use Nginx as a front end? Yeah. Yeah. And some good reading if you want to know more about these topics. Uh, I will have more on the, the course homepage. Of course, um, and if you want to update the, the good reading uh, links on our homepage, you can uh, just edit it uh, and make a pull request on GitHub. If you find some good reading, please update. Uh, that's it for this lecture about web servers. Uh, the students who are registered for the course will of course have a group discussion afterwards, but that will be in Swedish and only for the registered students. And we will use Discord as usual. So next time? Next time we will talk about Active Directory, I think. Yes. So how to what that is and how we use that. Uh, maybe not the installation part. We'll do that in the live demos. Uh, I can say that um, if you think it's cloudy today, well, that's because we have our cloud up and running now. Uh, so there will be some live demos on that and how to get started. 
John and I are trying to understand how it works and uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we have a student here uh, who are trying it out now. Uh, so hopefully you all will get uh, accounts in the cloud uh, the next couple of days. Uh, yeah, that's it. And if you want to take part of those lectures, please subscribe below.